Before we get started, just to cover my ass, I'm going to give out that uh, normal warning that I normally do, which is, if you're under the age of 18, maybe take a hike until you're a little bit older. I'm just trying to avoid getting emails from safe space parents and safe space kids saying that I ruined their lives or something like that. (laughs) So, alright, now let's continue. Uh, We are at episode 3. We're going to be picking up where we left off from episode two. Episode two, I talked about how much of a difficult time I had in high school and developing panic attacks and eventually getting on medication, gaining a bunch of weight because I was on medication, and then I eventually got off the medication. But the weight slowly came off. And while still being in high school, I was still doing high school things, and eventually, one of those things, for most people, I think, is getting a vehicle. Now, as you can imagine how this podcast has been the first two episodes, yeah, I found a way to make it perverse, perverted, dirty, and that's that's what I'm going to talk about, at least starting off. Uh, this episode's going to be a little bit longer, but let's pick up where we left off. So, around the age of, I think, 17, 18, something like that. I eventually got a vehicle. And my first vehicle was, are you ready for this? A 98 Ford Windstar. And yes, it's a van if you didn't know. And it was green, so it was fucking really ugly, really atrocious. But I took care of it, a lot of the maintenance by myself and whatnot. This thing was a chunker, though. But as you can imagine, it being a minivan, when you have friends like I did... You get asked to fucking go everywhere. Oh, can you take me here? Can you take me there? And I have the space, and they would offer gas money, so I would always find myself making a few extra dollars. And a little bit more as I got older, because not everybody had the ability to have a vehicle and fucking taxi everybody everywhere. So for me, it it eventually worked out, you know, pretty well in more ways than one. (laughs) So... As I discussed in the first two podcasts, one of the things that really excited me in terms of cross-dressing and getting my rocks off was always trying to find places in public or, if if it wasn't so public, places that I could possibly be seen while cross-dressing. And I would obviously always make it kind of difficult for that. I mean, it was usually at night and I was usually under the cover of night or had a bunch of obstructions like a house or vehicles in my way or just the shadows of trees and stuff like that. So it's not like I was trying to get caught because obviously if I wanted wanted to do that, I could. But, you know, as I got my vehicle and I was driving around and just enjoying just being on the main roads, not really thinking anything of it, the idea popped in my head one day as, you know, it would of, oh, how cool would this be if I were just to drive to one of these places, one of these quote-unquote public places, and kind of do my little routine and just hop back in my vehicle and pretend like nothing had happened. Well, I did that. I did that, in fact, several times. The first place that I ever just said, fuck it, and I just couldn't help myself anymore was a place not too far from my house, it was a restaurant slash banquet hall. It was off of a main road, but the main road gets really twisty as it goes towards my house. So even though you can see this place, this restaurant slash banquet hall from the main road, it's, it's like right there. It's on a twisty and turny, bendy kind of road. So you, you're not going to really be paying too much attention to it because you have to pay attention to the road. It gets really twisty and there's trees fucking everywhere. At least at the time there was. Now there's hardly anything there. You could see it in plain sight. But obviously, at the time that I would be going, it would be midnight or later, 1, 2 in the morning sometimes. And keep in mind, I'm doing this during like summer break when I do have this vehicle. So it's not like I'm doing this 
in the middle of the school week or something like that. Not that that would necessarily stop me, but it just makes things easier when you can do things like this during the summertime. Anyways, getting back to my point. So, this restaurant was right on the water. And, you know, I'd leave at whatever time was appropriate. I would usually, you know, have my normal stuff like my skirt and my high heels. And sometimes I would skip the top just to have less bullshit to deal with. But this... Uh, this restaurant, Banquet Hall, the parking lot was pitch black. Even though they had uh, lights, they would never use them if it wasn't active. So this place is just fucking pitch black all the time. The cool thing about this, because I used to do Flatland BMX in this parking lot sometimes during the summer as well. If you don't know what Flatland BMX is, look it up. It's just doing a bunch of tricks and manuals on one one tire, whether it's the front or the back. Anyways. Sticking to the subject. Around the back of the restaurant, you could easily park behind a section of the building. So if you just pulled up enough close to the building, you couldn't tell that any vehicles were at the facility at all, which was really nice. And that's what I did. So obviously I scoped it out once I got this idea in my head over the course of like a few days. I eventually get there with all my gear, pull, pull in super fast pull into the back of the uh, facility, get out, and it's a fenced-off area. It's pitch black, and the uh, the fence, it's not like that shitty backyard chain-link thing fence. It's uh, that, like, property fence that you see that's, like, black with, like, a bunch of pillars. And I w- it obviously wouldn't stop me, but I would hop that, and just, like... I discussed in episode one and two as far as like doing my little sexy walk and and stripping off the clothes. I couldn't help myself. Did that. And because it's pitch black, and it's cut off completely from any houses or anything. It's on the water and it, the section of land that it's on. You can't can't see it from the mainland. So I'm out there. So unless anybody's going to drive back there, nobody's going to have any idea that anybody's back there, and it was really nice. So I took my time, and it was it was really nice. They had nice tables and chairs, and the uh, the ground, it wasn't, it wasn't granite, but it was some kind of stone that was really flat and, and really nice to walk on. So as I discussed before, that, that sound that my high heels make when I'm walking all sexy and doing my little strip tease and whatnot, my little catwalk, my little runway uh, runway routine, it it hit all the different spots, and the thing that was really nice about it, though, it being secluded in black and being able to take my time, I was able to be in a public spot and kind of, you know, just sit towards the water and just kind of be in that headspace and get that that high, that drunk feeling that I had before, but really sit in it, whereas before... I couldn't do it for more than a few minutes at a time. And whenever I'd go to this place, it would be like 10 or 15 minutes of me just doing whatever you can imagine back there. Nothing with toys or anything like that. But, yeah, I was dressing all sexy, moving all sexy, stripping all my clothes off, masturbating all over the place, and then finishing up, hopping back in the vehicle, and then just continuing to drive, go back home and pretend like nothing ever happened. And I think I did this. About four or five times, probably a little bit more, because once I, you know, once you figure out all the different ways to deal with a situation like that, and once you get comfortable with it, you can kind of get, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not effective. Anyways, you know what I'm talking about. You get uh, really, um, damn, I can't think of the word right now. Anyways, so I did that several times, and, you know, if you if you stop and whether you want to go on YouTube or Google or just hop in a porn site or something like that and just type in cross-dresses in public, it's the same, it's the same type of behaviors of walking sexy, walking feminine, behaving fe- in a feminine way. 
and most people, their cars are involved because most of the people that are doing this are usually adults. But uh, the the scenarios always seem to be the same for the most part as far as like being in a public pl- a place, doing it immediately, and then going right back to your car and taking off. And I think it's hard to deny that there's always a certain taboo feeling that you enjoy swimming in, you know, so to speak. But I also think it's a way for a lot of cross-dressers to be easily validated. And by that, I mean you can be in that feminine feeling, but it's a way to do it in public or on your own without having anybody else's input. And you're just kind of living in your own fantasy of, like, whatever spectrum you fall you fall on as far as the stuff you like to wear or how physical you like to be in that space. That's really what I've taken a lot from it, especially starting out. As I got older, it would take on a different meaning because I feel like anybody, as you, male or female, trans or whatever, as you really explore that sexuality, you're you're just going to keep moving down the line of either what makes you feel sexy, and then if it just becomes less taboo, then it might become a more normal part of your life. Now, with a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, it's it's really brazen and really aggressive, and you're probably not going to see too many people, whether they're cross-dressing or not, just masturbating in public and almost trying to get caught. <laughs> So I'm not I'm not talking about that, but as far as like uh, trans people, whether that's female to male or male to female or some sort of non-binary spectrum, there might not be so much taboo involved as far as like oh I'm just able to go out in public now and feel more confident because people see me how the way I want to be perceived. So that's uh, that particular thing is more or less what I'm talking about. But, uh, yeah, after that, I would say that there was a very long slump. Because just like with everything else, as far as, like, the cross-dressing and getting my rocks off and, and looking for that next high, I I got, I don't want to say I got bored with it, but I got used to it. So that thrill of, you know, doing that thing in public and being all dirty and nasty, it just kind of fizzled out. And once you kind of know the risks and the likelihood that you are to either get caught or found out or you fully explore every avenue of whatever it is, in my case, it's uh, it's always going out in public, jerking off, wearing different combinations of items of clothing to always kind of keep it different. Once you fully explore everything you can with the stuff that you have, it's just kind of like, well, what else is next? What else can I do? What else is out there? But I would say I was on a... It was not 10 years, but it was probably closer to like an 8-year... Yeah, like, no, 6, 7 years, something like that, of things just winding down as far as that type of behavior, roughly speaking, probably a little bit less. But going... Through all this, I noticed that, you know, it was always inside of me, that that feeling, that cross-dressing feeling. Never never really thinking about it in those terms in my head, but it was always just like, what am I doing? And I, I would never even say, like, what is this behavior? What's wrong with me? Do I have some sort of disorder? And it wasn't so obvious at the time because it was never... It was never in my forethought. It was always in the back of my mind. And I, whenever I would finish in these little episodes of like masturbating in public, it was, it was never shame that followed afterwards. But I was always like, "Dude, what am I doing? You know, what is going on?" And kind of being thankful that I that it was over, and kind of being thankful that I never got caught. But then depending on my schedule and where I was in life, sometimes days or weeks or even months would pass. And then that feeling, you know, would bounce back. It would it would come back strong. 
and especially as like longer blocks of time would go by, it would it would be like a fever dream. You're going to hear me use that term a lot. And it's not because I don't have the lack of vocabulary to say something else. Because to me, that's really how it felt being in that headspace, doing it at these ages in public from beginning to end. It was like, it wasn't real. It was a certain sense of euphoria. And I don't know how it is for other people, but I've had this feeling sometimes Throughout my life, not it, it doesn't have to do with cross-dressing, but it would happen a lot when I would cross-dress when I was younger. But do you ever have that feeling where you're in the, it could be any time of day, and you all, all of a sudden, it feels like you're dreaming? Like you have like this numbness in your head, almost? I know that almost sounds like I'm having a, maybe like a mental breakdown or something like that. But it was... uh. It was like a euphoric feeling. And like I said, it didn't always, uh, it's not always related to like cross-dressing and whatnot, but most of the time when I was cross-dressing, that euphoric dream state, fever dream type of feeling that I'm describing, it would always be present then. It would eventually go away the older I got, I think mostly due to the fact of you do anything enough and it becomes more normalized and less taboo and you just kind of move on throughout your day. So it's not it's not so crazy. It's not so out of the norm for you. For obviously anybody else it would be. So in that case, if you were to get caught or whatever, it would just be like, oh my God, this is crazy. But so time went on uh, over the course of I think to the ages of 18 to 21, I worked a few smaller shitty jobs. I worked at I worked at a Burger King for a few months. I fucking hated that. I quit immediately. Then I worked at a candy shipping company. We made candy and, and distributed it for schools. Now that job was pretty sweet because you got to play with toys and fucking candy all day. And it was a really big joke. But uh, the thing is, it was seasonal. And if you're wondering what I'm referring to, do you ever see those kids in schools with the pamphlets and they're like, hey, do you want to buy some candy? It's for fundraiser, whatever, blah, blah, blah. We were one of those things. So we made all the orders and everything was in a uh, one of those assembly line type of setups. So every every lane had different candies and toys and we would just ship them to schools and we did that all day for like three months. It was really fun. Then after that, I worked at a KB Toys for like six months or something like that. Then, then things kind of slowed up. But I eventually got a job at a hospital as a janitor. Now this job was pretty sweet. It paid more than all my other jobs before ever have. Now, because it's not just because of this job, but because I had other things going on in my life, I. Uh, I would eventually move out after getting this job because I was making much more money. I, it wasn't just enough money to where I can pay for my phone and, and maybe buy a pair of pants. I was I was buying those raver pants at the time and, and some other silly shit for my car. But after I moved out, I moved in with one of my best friends for a few months. And that, that was pretty fun. We were just watching fucking anime all the time and playing Magic the Gathering silly shit. But because his parents were trying to sell the house, I couldn't really dress up my room the way I liked. Uh, I would like to. So I eventually rented a flat much farther from my job, but I lived by myself. And, and things were really nice. I was really content. Around this time, I was really happy. I really started finding I, my, I don't want to say like my own personal niche because I'm talking about my personal life, but... I started to find my groove with the things that really made me happy. So, like, during the day, before I would go to work. Oh, side note. At the at the job, at the hospital job, I started working day 7 to 3.30. But I could not fucking hack it because I was late almost every single day for months. And my boss, uh, on the first shift, gave me a warning. He's like, hey, if you're 
late, constantly like this, we're going to have to fire you. Maybe try second shift. I did, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But so during the day, I would do my BMXing. I would find a nice uh, flat um, flat parking lot at a church. And for BMX Flatland, it's imperative that you find flat land to do your tricks on because that's, that's where the name comes from. Um, after that, I would usually go for a walk. And usually before work, I had enough time in between those things to grab my subway, grab a foot long. And yes, I was doing the subway diet, but for me, it definitely worked. I was going back and forth between the tuna and the Italian BMT, and things were working out great. So I mentioned before that I was really overweight. I gained a lot of weight. I peaked at 250, and at this time, with uh, portion control and whatnot, and me just trying to display a little bit more self-control in my life, I was getting down to 185, and I was it was a fit 185. I wasn't I wasn't flabby, so I was definitely getting more attention from from the ladies, which was really nice. But uh, aside from all that stuff, I was also working on my art, like two to three hours a day, in a combination of like before and after work. So it's like an hour here, maybe an hour after work, and I fucking loved it. And going for going for my walks because I was living in a ni- uh, nice area at the time. Living in Ferndale, and if you I, if I haven't mentioned I live in Michigan, but at the time I was living in Ferndale, and if you go for walks during the day or the night, you know it's nice to walk on sidewalks rather than just on a road or on a dirt road or something like that. So I was walking every day, seven days a week, and on top of having a physical job, so the weight just kept coming off. I felt fucking amazing and. One of the things that I was also happy about going from the day shift to the second shift. The second shift was like it was three to eleven thirty, which also came came with a shift premium. Most hospitals have shift premium. If you didn't know, it's pretty sweet. But you know, working days at the hospital, I found myself being really fucking miserable because it just seemed like everybody in every single department of the hospital hated being there. They just had shitty attitudes. They would be really dismissive about everything. And every department, even my own. But going from the first shift to the second shift, it was like being in a different dimension. Every, every, everybody and everything about my job then was just better. The job itself was better. All, and all I was doing, for the most part, was just hauling trash. So going from all the different patient floors... And different sections of the hospital, picking up trash, taking it to the back of the hospital, putting it in the trash compactor, and going back out. And I would just do this constantly. And you get like three different breaks throughout the day. I think it was like two fifteens and a half an hour or something like that. It it wasn't the best, but the job was pretty fun. And once you figure everything out, everything just is like clockwork. Really loved it. But yeah, I couldn't I couldn't help but noticing constantly just how much more I liked my job of the work being better just people walking down the hallways like even the patients that are were just visiting you know their their friend or family member management was nicer but um you know at this time I was also hanging out with my cousin a lot which was a lot of fun and we were Usually hanging out on his side of town. He lived a little bit farther away from my job. But uh, it, it was definitely, at the time, it was more of a hike for me. And I, you know, to be honest, I didn't have much of an environment, that being my little flat and in Ferndale. I didn't have really enough space to entertain. And because I didn't have any AC and all I had was, like, windows... <laughs> It sucked to visit me because I lived upstairs and it was fucking hot. But because I lost a lot of weight, I could I could withstand being hot and sweaty and I'd be fine for a really long time. But my cousin, he was a bigger dude, so he's just like, dude, being at your place kind of fucking sucks. Just come over. And we would always hang out in the basement and he had air conditioning on top of that. So it was cold as fuck at his place, which was really nice. So even though I lost a lot of weight, it was much nicer. That Plus, he had... All sorts of video games and toys and whatnot. But hanging out with my cousin during this time in my life was fucking amazing. We we would hang out just about every single weekend. 
one of the things, well, we had a few different activities, but one of the things that we would do would be going to the titty bar a lot. We started we started doing that as much as we could afford to because, you know, when you look at parking and getting a booth and then trying to get drinks and then maybe food and dance, you could easily spend $150 and leave with, like, hardly any anything worth talking about. You're just like, I fucking spent $20 on drinks. I spent $40 on two dances or, or whatever. We were just trying to really get out there. Because remember, we were in our early 20s, so our testosterone was was kind of peaking out. It was, it was really insane. And the other thing that we would do, and this thing, I, I don't know how we found out about it. I know he was always on the lookout for you know, different activities and doing different things. He, he really liked just mingling with people and just different experiences. I, not so much, but me being with him and even his family not doing this type of stuff. Everything was always a fucking adventure, and I loved it. But specifically, he's like, hey, we got to go to this thing. It was, I believe it was called Chaos Detroit. I could be wrong, but it was in this bar in Hamtramck called Mephisto's. It was like a three-level bar, and I think it was either on Thursday nights and or the weekends, the, these people would come in, and it was part of, like, I want to say a circus act, but they weren't a circus. But basically, they had stilt walkers, jugglers, stripper, strippers, burlesque dancers, drag queens, um, even magicians. Hang on, i got to take a sip of my energy drink here. Oh, sorry about that. I was running low. <laughs> and I remember finding everything so appealing, not just on a sexual level, because, you know, some of the girls there had, like, split tongues. They had tattoos. They were wearing these crazy contacts and all these different hairstyles I'd never seen before. But on um, just on a curiosity level, I was like, oh, my God, I never would think to – to do this stuff myself, it was so out of my, out of my realm of existence, and I remember just being fucking fascinated by, it. and it just stuck with me for a very long time of, like a really prominent memory of just seeing this. Every time we would go, it was, God, I would have to say there was maybe fourteen, fifteen different people. Maybe, maybe 20, because there was a lot of different performers there that just took up all three uh, levels of the of the the bar called Mephisto's, which I don't think is open anymore. I don't know if that's a COVID thing and they got shut down, but it's dead from what I can tell. And I don't know what happened to that group. I don't know how many years ago. This is a long time ago. Right now it's 2021, and when all this was going on, this was, this was like the early 2000s. So this is like 2004, 2005, something like that. So it's a long time ago. But we would do that. And I remember one of the other things we would do during the weekends. And this and this may sound weird that I would hang out with my cousin and do this stuff. But on top of – or besides going to the titty bar and going to this place called Mephisto's, we would also go to like porn shops and just check out the different sections of porn. Because, again – and I'm going to mention this, maybe just so I don't sound so perverted, hanging out with a family member doing this. Maybe it's not so perverted, but I'm I'm sharing a lot of my personal life with you. So I guess I'm hoping that some of these listeners are like, oh, yeah, no, I did this with my brother or cousin or, you know, friends or whatever. But anyways, I remember we would also go to, like, sex shops looking at the, the different porn sections and just how creepy they were. Some of these places had, like, those – um sex rooms or, or blowjob booths or glory holes. But I remember we would, you know, look at some of these things, and we would always try to find some of the DVDs. On top of, like, just finding quality DVDs, which is really hard to do on a budget, because, like, if you're going to find a decent DVD, you're spending between 40 and $60 on a single DVD. And, yeah, it's usually three or four hours of, like, really good content, but you could spend... Six or eight dollars on ten or twelve hours of bullshit, and it'd usually be like a three or four CD pack or whatever, and they would just cram it full of fucking shitty porn. 
but one of the things we thought was funny is we would buy the most hardcore intense porn DVDs we could find. Looking by the cover, because obviously they're not going to let you toss them into the VHS player or the DVD player that they would have in the store and like let you test it out and see how it is. Or they didn't do that. Although they would play porn, you know, on a TV, one or two screens or something like that, just so you kind of be in the mood as a viewer and just see like what it was called because they would usually display the box next to the tv so you could see what scene it was from or what what movie it was from and we would watch this with a group of his friends on his side of town yeah usually his parents were gone or sometimes we would be at somebody else's house and there'd be a group of like six seven or eight of us just watching porn together and you know if you look for fucked up shit <laughs> Eventually, you're going to find some fucked up shit. And we just came across some scenes that we were just like, dude, this is this is depressing. This is sad. It, you would just you would see certain scenes that you're like, all right, everybody involved in this fucked up scene is really just trying to go over the top to sell to sell the scene. So whether it's male, female, whatever the fuck. But you would come across these other these other videos or scenes <laughs> that were just so so sad and so aggressive in the in the wrong way you could tell that most of the time that the women didn't want to be there and you know sometimes they would be really degrading and you're just like this isn't fun at all and i remember i remember one of the one of the actresses we came across at the time, for whatever reason, maybe it was just this particular scene, but it was with Missy Monroe and her scenes since then don't come off that way. But it was this one particular scene and I'm not going to go into detail, but not because it's that bad or whatever. But we were just watching. We were just like, dude, what in the fuck? And it was like paired with another another scene. And this guy was just making this fat girl eat chips out of a bag and calling her pig and it. And then there was like another one with a midget, and they were talking down to him. And I was like, "Dude, this is, this is not fun or sexy at all." And I eventually just threw the DVD DVD away, and we just stopped for, I think we stopped entirely. We we might have continued at some point, or at least just to talk about it or, or buy different magazines, because that was one of the other things that was becoming more popular is, uh, not dominatrix, but like latex magazines. But the reason I I brought a lot of this stuff up is because that that certain part of my brain that wasn't dealing with the cross dressing, whenever I would come in contact with anything relating to the cross dressing or anything that I thought was sexy for several reasons, one of those reasons being like, Oh man, that, that chick looks hot. It would be it would be nice to own the same stuff she does. Whether it was like heels or a bra or maybe she had a certain sexy haircut that I would just like to emulate. And one of the things that always caught my attention while me and my cum, my cum, Jesus, me and my cousin would be looking at in the porno shops is it, they have different sections. So it's like, you know, str it would be like straight porn, which is majority of the porn. And all these are like handwritten tags, like usually torn off cardboard from like a box or something like that. And then gay porn and tranny porn. But the tranny porn would always catch my attention. And I was always trying to, like scope it out while he would like turn his back or he'd be down another aisle or something like that. But I was still really not ashamed, but when you're going through this, it's like, and especially this is like the early 2000s and, and me in my early 20s. So it's like, who can I trust? Who am I going to tell? Just felt, I don't, ashamed isn't the right word, but we'll just substitute that with being terrified of not knowing what he would say. So we'll, we'll swap out one word for a whole se <laughs> a whole vague sentence. But that's that's really how that was. So in the in the space that I wouldn't be cross dressing, because when I lived with my one friend be before I moved out into that upper flat, I didn't do any cross dressing then, and I didn't do any when I lived in that upper flat. And things were things were pretty dry as far as the whole cross dressing thing is and i and it would you know it would like 
reach its way into the front part of my brain and be like, damn, I miss doing that. I wish I fucking owned something or had some money for something. But I just didn't. I didn't have any extra money because back then, just like now, if you look at a pair of, like, ankle boots or, like, the high heels that I get, which is, like, 10-inch ankle boots from Pleaser, they're, like, $118. They're fucking expensive. And even if back then they they weren't that much, they were probably, like, 96 or $110 or something like that if you account for inflation. So it, it, I was really looking for a way to express it. Now, I will say that I... I mostly like women, so with my job and and lit and going from like living at home to living with people, I didn't really have enough time or the space or the privacy to, to dress up. So that was also another reason why I just I wasn't letting it take over as far as you know making more making more space for it in my day or or my week or whatever. So it did take a backseat for quite some time. So after I moved out, lived lived with my buddy, then even when I lived by myself in my upper flat, I just I, it just wasn't there as much as I would like it to be. But you know, I was still hanging out with my cousin. We we were probably doing this every every weekend thing for almost a year straight. There was very few weekends that went by that I wasn't hanging out with him. Not and it's not that I didn't have any other friends, but the stuff we were doing, we were both so into at the time. I didn't have any other friends that either had money or wanted to go to the titty bar all the time and watch porn and go to this weird place called Mephisto's and Hamtramck with all these crazy people dressing up. It was it was fucking amazing. I loved it. And you know, trying to think back now there was there was weekends where I didn't hang out with him. And when he would be working or on the weird case that uh he just had something he had to do, and we just didn't have time for it. Be like, all right, well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna hang out on my side of town this weekend and save a little bit of gas money or whatever. I would just hang out with my friends and play Magic the Gathering or Golden Eye and Nintendo 64, whatever we were doing at the time, <laughs> and eventually just get back into hanging out with my cousin and doing all that crazy stuff. But it it wasn't just the crazy stuff that I had fun doing with my cousin. Because we didn't do that every weekend. We didn't have the money to do that every weekend. But the other stuff that crosses my mind as far as like, hanging out with my cousin, we would get in his vehicle and just drive around on his side of town. And before we would get in like our little routes, we would just pick a direction and just fucking drive for 30, 45, an hour. Just drive all over the place, just checking out nooks and crannies of different cities. But we would hit up 7-Eleven get loaded up on snacks and energy drinks and just listen to music and eventually just talk and ask each other crazy questions, which would eventually become like our question game. I'd talk about anything and everything for a while. And I do remember thinking back that one of the things we would do, and I completely forgot I did this, but we would stay up for well over 24 hours consistently during the weekends. It was really over the top. Um, I don't know if the people listening are either old enough to remember this or ever bought these things, but there were these pills called Stacker 2 that you could buy that were extremely potent. Now, the interesting thing about Stacker 2 is at the time, they were put in a substance, This it was like a powder substance, similar to caffeine, but it was stronger. It was called ephedra. And kids, there was one or two cases of kids dying taking these things because these things packed a fucking punch. Now, an energy drink at the time, I don't think, was really over 100 milligrams. And caffeine pills themselves are about 200 milligrams of caffeine. And I don't think they can consist of much else other than maybe some sort of binding agent or some other powder or something like that just to keep it in tablet form. But the Stacker 2s had caffeine had vitamin B, they had ginseng, ephedra. These things would make sleepy time go away. I never, I'm going to be straight with you, I never tried Coke. The, the most I ever tried was smoking weed. I tried it three times, and all three times it really burnt my fucking lungs. It wasn't for me. I'm not a smoker. I haven't tried it since then. It's been six or seven years since I think I tried that. So I do just fine with that. I'm weird enough without it. So, But anyways, 
we would pop these fucking pills, and we would be up for like a day and a half before we would even crash at all. So like I would go to his house, like on a Friday night, sometimes pop these pills, and the whole Saturday would go by, and I would be going home Sunday morning while having not gone to bed that entire time, and we would do that often. It was it was a lot, and because I wasn't. I didn't have school anymore because I'm in my early 20s. I would just do this as, as much as I could think that my body could handle it. And even then, I wouldn't get like eight hours of sleep. I would crash for a little bit, stay up the whole day, and then go to bed, go, go back to bed at my normal time. Now this time, because I was working like a second shift, I was going to bed around 2, at latest 3. So I'd be waking up around 11 something and still have time to get shit done before work. I fucking... I really loved it. Everything about my day, or about this, like, about my week was just really, really nice in this time of my life or whatever. But working at this hospital, and this is a very important part of the story, all of this has its purposes. But during this time working at the hospital, I eventually started seeing somebody that worked at the hospital. She worked in a totally different department. She wasn't a janitor like I was. She worked as uh, a rad tech. So she did x-rays and whatnot. She made way more money than I did, that's for sure. But she was really nice. And still, during this whole time, so about four years have passed, and I've hardly done any cross-dressing. And... You know, because I was playing the field really fucking hard and doing all this crazy stuff on the weekends, I really wasn't thinking about it. I was too busy just fucking around, playing video games with my cousin when we weren't doing all that other crazy stuff, talking about UFOs over a campfire. But when I met her, things slowed down. And, you know, as it is, you have that new relationship energy, as you might hear it uh, referred to listen to other people talk about that type of stuff but met her sex was amazing really aggressive and the thing that made her fun is she had she had an amazing body she was only five foot tall but she had big tits a tiny waist and very wide hips which kind of gave her a fat ass being five foot tall and whenever she would wear things like high heels lingerie it would just accentuate everything else that much more, which made it super fucking sexy. But, you know, like like all relationships, and I, I don't think I'm too different in this regard, but after you do all your crazy shit, everything eventually slows down. You get into more of that relationship mode to where it's just you hanging out with that other person during the week, eating your food, getting fat together. And that eventually did happen. You know, you you gain a little bit of that relationship weight (laughs) or that wedding weight, whatever you want to call it. We didn't get married. But, yeah, things things were pretty fun. But things slowed down. And, you know, as time went on, things got more serious. And for me, it that family life that I was always trying to avoid that I seen so many of my friends and family members get in, that was a really big turnoff for me as far as like things slowing down. You're just doing stuff in the family. So whenever a holiday comes up, you got to go to this person's house and that person's house and fucking buy presents for, for their kids that you only see during the holidays. And it was just like, dude, this is just fucking lame. And it, it wasn't like that at first, but over the course of, I think our relationship lasted about five years or something like that, give or take. It it eventually it eventually grew to that. But before things really slowed down with us, one of the things that did pop in my head when I was dating her is those feelings to dress up again. And seeing her with her lingerie and some of her clothing, like the high heels and like her sex toys, those those ideas slowly creeped back in and one of the things that I do need to note during this is living with her. She had a computer, all right. I didn't grow up with a computer at all. I didn't. I didn't think to own one because the internet at 
at the time wasn't what it is now. There was no YouTube. There was no Netflix. Google was the most popular and exciting thing. But porn, you know, because it is the internet, was all over the place. And I, I eventually was like, well, instead of trying to buy all this tranny porn and cross-dressing porn, because then on top of not having the money to to buy it, even the cheapest stuff, because it, it, it did suck anyways, I was like, let's use this fucking computer. And if I just erase my cookies and my history on there, I should be good. And for the most part, I was. But hopping on the computer... And starting looking for like tranny porn, and I'm not saying that to be abrasive or offend anybody, but that's that's what we called it then. So I'm that's the language I'm going to use. And and me being a cross dresser myself and getting a lot of work done physically, I kind of take that slot up as far as you know a, a label as as far as identifying myself, I guess. But tranny, uh, cross dresser porn, transvestite porn, these are all the different keywords you could use, whether it be in Google. Or just finding like some sort of porn engine or archive as they were referred to back then. You just type it in and then thousands and thousands of fucking like little links would just pop up with like tranny this, transvestite that, chick with dick this. So I got involved doing that. And I got hooked in a different way as far as having that that drug like drug like feeling come in it was finding people that looked how i wanted to look and watching them scene after scene video after video online of the just them doing all this crazy shit and i thought it was so fucking hot to just finally see the stuff that i've been acting out in in my personal life like right in front of me real life people and, you know, I, now that I think back, I think I was kind of addicted to it just for the simple fact that I went through so much of my life without a computer. Now I finally have one at the age of, was it, 20, 22 or 23. So all those years without really any computer access other than at school. And then at school, the most advanced it got as far as computer stuff for me was playing SimCity. And then you using the cheat code SHIFT, F-U-N-D, and getting a bunch of money. Um, and then some typing classes or maybe tr working on something for my English class. That was it. And now I just have the whole world of porn. And watching the tranny porn was something I would look forward to constantly. And I remember specifically, I remember going through watching all this tranny porn. And I came across this one person, and back then they didn't have a lot of the tags that you have in videos now. It's where it's like, it, it's identified not only by category, but like the porn star's name, and then like all these subcategories. It was just like, tranny, or shemale, or crossdresser, chick with dick. It was very basic as far as how they were described, but it was it was for people to click on. So with whatever you were looking for, it was... You wanted big tits or big dicks or whatever. That's what was in the title for the video. I came across this transsexual porn star. Didn't know who it was. And I kept looking for videos of this person. Which would eventually be identified as Lisa Lawrence. And she was really more of a 90's transsexual porn star. And she, I believe she's half black and half German. So she has this really unique look to her, and seeing her, I just lost my shit. I've never seen anybody like her, and for the fact that she had a penis, I was even more turned on. Not that that's a requirement for me to be turned on, but if you're talking about cross-dressing and transsexuals, that's kind of that's kind of in the description. You know what I mean? And after watching so many scenes with her. I came across this other person, which turned out to be her friend. I, and I didn't know that at the time, but you, you do research. Or as obsessed as, as I was at this time, I just was clicking on everything that was available for these two. But the, the next person that just made me lose my shit completely was Sylvia Boots. She was also a 90s performer. And I she was either Cuban or she was from South America. One of the two. I'm not I'm not too sure exactly, but 
she had a very unique look to her and everything about her just fucking broke me as as a person that watches porn as a person that cross dresses themselves and just wanted everything to do with that type of lifestyle uh everything about her seemed to be accentuated to the max at least for that time now you you have all sorts of crazy physical attributes that just break the limits of science it seems with some of these chicks and their uh chicks or chicks with dicks with their stuff that they got done as far as surgeries like lips anything that they've done to their face tits ass whatever but no everything about her was like the whole package like her face her hair smile her accent her tits her hips her legs and one of the things that really stuck out to me more than more than all that and i i know, I know that's unbelievable but it was her attitude and her scenes that i didn't see anybody else have not even at the time not even female performers but it was her attitude and scenes and that like she wanted to she wanted to be there so, like she really enjoyed getting fucked and fucking and doing other scenes with chicks with dicks or transsexual porn stars okay and with men, because she, she was like a switch. She was top and bottom. The only people that really come to mind now, as far as like popular people, would be Gianna Michaels or Angela White. If you're, if you're talking about people that look like they're enjoying their scenes. Oh, and, you know, I will also say Mia Isabella, to add another transsexual porn star for today's standards. So if anybody wants to see what I'm talking about, that, that relentless sexy face that they have and they always seem like they're just having a good time that's that's what's a really big turn on for me as far as pretty much i would say pretty much any any category of porn that i watch but one of the things that really struck me as this was going on is i got such a such a sense of exhilaration just from watching her and like her having such a good time that i wanted to dress even more so just like all the other times in the past where I would, you know, use borrow somebody else's clothes, <laughs> quote unquote, I would use the, you know, my girlfriend's clothes to, to dress up and I would use some of her sex toys because I was watching some of the stuff that I just wanted to emulate at this point. I was really trying to more or less, more or less copy of what I was seeing you know, on the Internet, on this tiny screen that I was watching. And it was all just so fucking hot for me. And I thought, how how nice would it be and how intoxicating would it be to look like Sylvia Boots and also not just look like her, but even in her scenes by like by other performers, whether they were men, women, or whatever, she looked desired. Like, people looking at her were turned on by just looking at her and just fucking her and whatever else. And I thought that'd be so hot to... To have the same thing done to me, or not done to me, but to have people, to have people to share that moment with, you know, to not be alone and be so in the, so in the closet about it, not to, you know, but. So what I would eventually do is start to really act out with some of these toys, and one of the things that I found myself doing was masturbating with a particular toy while being dressed up so at this point the girl i'm with she has she has some pretty sexy heels that i barely fit in just because of how they're how they're made and because i was so much taller than she is i'm five eight she was five foot i was able to kind of smash my feet and nose and she had much more to wear as far as like skirts and you know sexy tops and jackets and stuff like that but one of the things that i would do is we had this giant uh cushiony seat that we had in the living room and i would lay on that with my back on the main part of the chair and my ass facing where your where your back would be and i would have the toy inside me and i would pull myself into the toy like towards the wall and i'd have the porn plan at the same time and i would kind of keep up with the thrusting that i would see in these videos and uh Doing this, I was able to actually have a no-hand orgasm. And if you don't know what that is, or if, or, if, or if you're not familiar with the term, as you might come across on Pornhub or whatever, it's basically getting a sexual workup and being able to come 
for the most part without jerking yourself off. So because of the stimulation of the toy anally and hitting that G-spot and, and watching what I was watching online, I was able to come twice just by fucking myself with the toy. And that was such such a turn-on for me that that was able to happen that I became locked into that. And that became a new thing. And there, at the time, there wasn't... There wasn't terms for most of the stuff that I'm describing to you. So whether it's middle school, high school, and then now I'm right out of high school and I'm in my early 20s. There's not terms for most of the stuff. It, as far as it goes, it's just with like the no, ho- no hands orgasm that I'm discussing now. It wasn't even described like that. It, it At the most you would see if you're look, looking at porn or something, it was like tranny comes while getting fucked anally or something like that. That's how it was described. They had these whole sentences that are now broken down into one or two words. But, you know, things evolve just like everything. So whether you're talking about Facebook or YouTube or MySpace. (laughs) Fucking MySpace. Fuck that website. Anyways. um, Yeah, so that, that became my next hottest thing was to try to emulate what I was seen online and then once that became a thing that was even a harder thing to reach because it was such a it was so physically taxing to do that by myself and not have somebody else i guess help help me along with that now one of the one of the things that helped me get to that point of orgasm was because i was dressed up and because i was watching tranny porn and on top of all that i was putting my myself mentally in the place of people like Sylvia Boots or Lisa Lawrence. There's a whole host of other people I can't even think of right now that are that were popular back then and even now have like Instagram accounts and whatnot. But I eventually would say something to the girl I was dating and she never found out at any point in time that I was into cross dressing or whatever. And she she eventually did find out that I was watching tranny porn and one of them she mentioned it when we were in a group of people or whatever. She didn't go into depth with it, but he, uh, I was with my cousin and his girlfriend at the time, and she, and he was, she said something like, "Oh, he likes Holly's sweet," and they just like looked at me and they didn't ask any questions. She looked at me and I, I felt really embarrassed. But Holly Sweet was a transsexual porn star back then, and I think she even worked up into the early mid two thousands. But she was extremely curvy. I think she was a little bit taller, giant tits giant ass and for somebody that's a transsexual performer you don't see somebody with as naturally wide of hips and big as tits as she had so that that's kind of why i gravitated towards her but so sylvia boots was still like my number one but even even having my girlfriend included as far as um as far as like working me anally and fingering me using a toy on me like just in my ass and going down on me and stuff it, it wasn't the same so we just continued with a lot of the different sex and whatnot. I, I would say now more vanilla than anything. I'm not sure how crazy a lot of her life was sexually back in the day, but I'm pretty sure it was nothing compared to mine. And things were pretty dry through through my 20s, all the way up into my late 20s. Th- things were fucking almost next to nothing. So, you know, we had that thing with i was at the restaurant when i was like 18 or 19 and it wasn't it wasn't much for four years until i met the girl i was with and that relationship lasted for about five years give or take and the the reason that ended is she really wanted to have a family and kids and i didn't i i knew i wasn't the type of guy for it and we were scheduled to get married and all that and she she was ready to have a kid it just wasn't for me so that came crashing down, and even even before I moved out, she was already dating somebody else. So things before things kind of came crashing down, she had already moved on, and she was really nice to me still. I didn't mind that she was dating anybody else because I, the way I seen it, is I got out of a bad situation, and you know she eventually got married to this guy, and had a kid and i haven't really heard from her since i know my mom has talked to her a few times or whatever and i guess she's doing just fine but it's 
it it wasn't for me. I'm much happier in my own little life now being being a shitty dad to some kid or being a horrible husband or life mate to somebody that I can't either show as much affection to or I just don't want to do that that family life. So w- with whatever reasons you want to include in that. But yeah, after after roughly 5 years that came to an end. So I was almost turning 27 cuz by the time I was moving out it was like Christmas Eve. And then after that it was two years living in somebody's basement, and that somebody was my mom's husband. So that was another two years of no cross-dressing. One, I didn't have the space. Two, I didn't have the money. Three, and I didn't have the privacy. And then it was just one shitty job after another, living in, living in his basement. Fucking sucked. I had this back-breaking bre- job as... Uh, it was janitorial, but it, I wasn't any at any one particular facility. We were a floor crew, and it was just eight hours of backbreaking work of stripping and waxing floors and doing carpet, and it just it was miserable. And I lost a lot of weight. I got down to like 134 or something like that, just because I wasn't eating. And I, my panic attacks kind of came back a little bit. I got into meds again. My life was fucking emotionally. I just wasn't able to keep up with everything that was going on. And it was more my fault than anything else. It wasn't – the world didn't have it out for me. Same same back as in high school. I, I just didn't know how to deal with a lot of the different things. And I, I will say, though, being with that, that girl that I was with for five years, I became really fucking lazy. And uh, I could have tried a lot harder with the, many different things. But there was, a lot of, there was a lot of facts in my life that I wasn't willing to face yet. And that all kind of came – to head when the relationship with her and I finally ended and then I ended up moving out. But then two years after being in this guy's basement, I lived in with my I moved in with my cousin and his wife, uh, Tiffany, which was basically two more years of no cross dressing. Anything that I did remotely in that vein is not even worth mentioning. So I'm just gonna say it was another two years of of me not cross dressing. So it was Six, seven years of me hardly having any fun in that regard, and it was really, really fucking dry, and it sucked. But the reason that I wanted to make this this an episode, and the reason I wanted to share it with a lot of people, and I know it's not as exciting as the last two episodes, was because from this point on, of this, this block of like six years of like nothing happening... It would be a very strong contrast to how my life would change over the next several years after that. So keep in mind, at this time, I'm about 27, 28. Or no, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm about 28, 29, uh, leaving my cousin's, uh, my cousin's house, something like that. And I eventually come into some money. So a family member dies, we had access to some money, and I end up buying a house. So I move out of my cousin's apartment living with his wife. And, you know, the rent was fairly good. It was fair. It was like $250, $300, split whatever whatever ways. And then finally, I got to move in with one of my other friends. But it was a three-bedroom house, uh, basement, garage. Two bath or one and a half baths. If you're gonna if you're gonna be using proper house talk, excuse me. <laughs> and things really fucking picked up from this point on. So going from a dry spell of seven years, let's say roughly, to things picking up, having everything my way, and having having my own safe space, having my own castle, things fucking took off and skyrocketed and I loved it. And the the reason I think it's important is not just to show you the contrast, but to share and to show what I think is the obvious signs of clearly this is a part of either my personality or and or my sexuality, however whatever descriptive you words you want to use to describe all this stuff. But it, it even in the certain times in my life where it, it was dormant and it stayed very quiet, and maybe I didn't have any 
time, money, or or privacy to take part in that type of uh, lifestyle or or dip into my slice of sexuality. When I had the the strong opportunities and finally the money and the privacy to do so, it fully flourished. Now, if you came across this podcast, whether it's on Twitter, Instagram, or you you maybe randomly came across it on you know a podcast somehow typing in some some specific tags or something like that, you might have come across some of the adult content that I produce on Pornhub and whatnot, or maybe you came across my account on FetLife, but where I'm at now is very different than where I was in in these slow years. And obviously, you know, starting out in middle school and then high school and all of my 20s almost, it's a very strong contrast. So which is why I want to say, if you are a cross-dresser or if you're, even if you're a male, or a female, I'm sorry, and you're a drag king, and you like to cross dress from female, and you like to look male. If it if it's something that keeps coming up for you, and it, it it's something that mentally resurfaces constantly throughout your life, consistently over time, then there's probably something more to it, and that's that's what I really wanted to share with this particular episode. Is if you if you have to keep hiding something, and you have to keep burying these feelings then there's probably more you need to explore with yourself. Because for me, I kept pushing it off for a very long time. You know, you know, the first two episodes, it was very back-to-back as far as if you were to look at a, a, you know, a time graph of like how many months went by from middle school to high school. I was consistently doing it and consistently raising the stakes. And things really dropped off because I was surrounded with people and I was too afraid to express myself and all the things that I desired or that I thought were sexy. And I, I kept them locked away in a closet, in a dungeon, buried because I thought it was too taboo to share with people because, you know, most of the time, especially if you're a quote-unquote straight guy or, or you're you're straight-looking or you're straight-acting, or me, in my case, I'm mostly attracted to women and the feminine figure. It, it, it changes a little bit when I'm making content online and whatnot, but... It's mostly the feminine figure that really turns me on. So if I ever use those terms as like as far as straight or straight acting or whatever, it's because I'm mostly attracted to women and in my personal life up to this point, it's mostly it's mostly just been women. So if you're also in that boat of like, hey, whether you have a family or not, if you're like, hey, you know, I'm in a relationship or I'm not in a relationship and I, I mostly like women but I'm too afraid to share this stuff, but I but I do it when I can. Well, there's probably something to it, buddy. There's, there's probably something that you're keeping locked inside. And I'm not saying that to shame you. I'm not saying, hey, you should come out and risk fucking losing your job or losing friends or causing an upheaval in your family. And like, oh my God, we didn't know you were gay or whatever the fuck people are going to say. But I'm just saying, and maybe you've already kind of delved in your own mind after the first two podcasts or even the intro. I don't know. But after this podcast, take a little bit of time to maybe explore those feelings by the time I come out with the next one. I'm going to talk about things a little bit more. Episode 4 will be it. But there's probably something to it. And there is a very small chance that maybe some of the people that are listening, it was a one-off of, hey, I wore my wife's or my girlfriend's panties, or maybe you wore, at some point in time, you wore your sister's whatever, or your mom's something or other, and you felt a certain way. Or... Like I said, if you're a drag king and you're a female and you like to dress masculine and you're like, hey, I wore my dad's boots or I wore my dad's work shirt or something, I felt really strong and masculine. I say, if you're listening to this and you're taking part in these activities every so often, whenever that is, okay, just think about things a little bit more. Try to try to bring these thoughts to the forefront of your brain. And really rest in them. That's it's easy for me now because I spent so much time dealing with the stuff. And one of the reasons that I started this podcast, as I've mentioned before in the intro and whatnot, is a lot of this information isn't out there for people that cross dress. It's it's very it's very brushed over very quickly. Even 
even in some medical journals and stuff, it's like, oh, we're talking about trans stuff. And, oh, cross-dressing is just this thing, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But anyways, back to trans people that are going through uh, transformations and getting on hormones and stuff. It's just, it's just glossed over. People don't talk about it. But because I've been in this, in this particular way for so long that I feel the cross-dressing aspect of the trans spectrum really needs to be discussed. And I, and I, I'm not ashamed to talk about it. I'm, and I'm not ashamed to share these crazy fucking stories with you because I know a lot of the people that are probably listening to this podcast are taking part in some way. And I know I have a few people that are just listening just to either hear my voice because most of my content online doesn't have my actual voice. It just has music playing over. But if you're if you're listening to this, hey, there's explored a little bit more. It's probably not gonna hurt. And I'm not saying risk your fucking family, risk your love life, risk your job or whatever. You don't have to come out as far as I have. For me, I've I've made a strong choice that this is going to be a much more prominent part of my life. And and in several years, I'm going to look much more different than I am now. And things for, things for me are going to change. And things for me are for me personally, are going to be very difficult because I've already lost a few friends just kind of sharing this this thing with them, and they, they didn't know how to handle it, and I haven't heard from them in a year or two or more. And it is what it is. You know, I, I know it is weird for a lot of people. And for all you sensitive people that might get upset at me for saying that it's weird, for most of the world, it's fucking really bizarre. Uh, you're somebody that dresses in the the clothes for the op- that are designed for the opposite gender. Most people don't know how to deal with it. It's fucking odd for a lot of people. So rather than walk away with any shame or try to be really abrasive and go in the opposite direction, I try to understand that it's not for everybody, and I try to approach people in a very reasonable manner that I think might be open to it, and if I don't think people are, then I don't bother with them because they, the, the, they don't have to know... And have that ha- have that information in their life that what my sexual proclivities are. It's not, it's not a need to know thing for them. But I'm getting off on a fucking tangent here. So that's that's my twenties into my thirties for the most part. Now, I did buy the house I believe before I was thirty. I gotta check the math on that. But it it was a rough it was rough twenties as far as all the cross dressing goes. And I'm going to leave it off there as far as any other stories or details because those are really the only fucking highlights. It was really dry. And I hope for anybody listening that your your 20s or whatever time you're going through is, is not as dry because it fucking sucks. If that's how you like to have fun like I do. But buying the house, things really pick up. And that's, that's where we're going to pick up next time. And I got many more stories to share that are just as crazy so episode three that is complete for us and i hope everybody had a good time and again i'm on um instagram and uh youtube pornhub whatever whatever any anywhere you can find social media i'm on there so if you just want to search for synthetic and in, in some iterations, it's going to be Synthetic 1369 or Synthetic 6969. Depending on what fucking app I'm, or what website I'm using, it's going to be a different a different assortment of things. But uh, Synthetic 6969 on Instagram. And from there, you can go to my link tree, and it's going to have all my stuff. Or if you are feel like looking at my adult content, just go to Pornhub. Uh, two words. Search for Synthetic. S-Y-N-T-H-E-T-I-C. And, you know, have a little bit of fun. But I will I will be open to uh, be taking emails from people. So if you want to send me an email at originalsyn1369 at gmail.com. Sin, spelled S-Y-N. Feel more than happy to. If you would like to make any comments about anything, uh, future episodes, we can talk about some stuff. Or if you have questions regarding cross-dressing, whether it's any type of gear you would like to buy, wigs, breast forms, high heels, uh, best prices, quality, hit me up. Let's start a dialogue. Let's, that's why I'm doing this whole fucking thing. I'm not trying to 
get rich off this. It's not to get AdSense or whatever. I'm doing this so I can try to help people like myself and, you know, help people that were like me at one point that had no fucking idea that was going on. So I did enough yammering on. That is episode three, and I will talk to you all later. Uh.